Are Bengal tigers related to Burmese tigers and all other tiger species? Are all known species of tiger related to each other and all other panthers? Are all panthers related to felines, scimitar cats, and other felids? Let us begin with the cat clade. We know the eight main lineages go back to the Sudelurus, which it descended from the Proelirus. Proelirus is the first true cat and the ancestor of the entire cat family, placing Polaris at the basal member of the feline classification. The bones of Proelirus are very similar to the living viverids and fossa of Madagascar today. Cat connoisseurs have long known that their feline friends have a wild origin. Now scientists have identified that the house cat's maternal ancestors are traced back to one place, the Fertile Crescent. Genetics proves that there are eight main lineages of the feline cat order. Seven of the eight major cat lineages are linked by hybridization. Only one, the bay cat lineage, has not been linked to hybridization but this is speculation to this day. These eight lineages, which are now 37 different species, all descended from eight types of base cats. The puma ancestor gave rise to the cheetah and the jaguar of today. The lynx gave rise to the Iberian and Canadian bobcats of today, and so on down the line. Today, we have 44 cat breeds alone, just in the common house cat. As you can see, it is very easy to track something back to a single species. Well, what happened when you track back to the eight main lineages? Well, when you find the branch narrows, you get to a few base cats, like the Pseudolirus and the Proalirus. Even a 2005 study placed the Proalirus as a basal member of the feline family. So, not only do we have genetic data to support that this cat gave rise to all the cat kinds we see today, we can also see that the genetic data shows extinct felids found in the fossil record were cats as well. They just died out. We creationists could easily say that God had created two or three separate types of cat in the beginning during creation week, but that doesn't answer the phylogeny challenge, and I do not have any evidence for that. But what I do have evidence for is a singular cat, which all cats descended from, which does answer the phylogeny challenge and proves creationism to be true. The evidence seems to be clear that God did create a single type of cat. Besides orphan genes and feline-specific ERBs and viruses, we even have more evidence outside of genetics now that shows the extent of the melanistic coat colors and patterns arose from a single original type that was either small spots or flecks. This is highlighted by changes observed in pelage patterns of jaguars and leopards during their development. Evidence is further backed up by a study by Liu and colleagues using their mathematical models. Since it's clear today that eight species of feline created all 37 species of feline and 44 cat breeds of today, then it's pretty obvious and feasible that God could have created a single feline to speciate into all the different kinds that we see today. Just like we now know for a fact that all humans descended from a single common female ancestor and we have all the different varieties and distinct people across the entire the original today. feline nor any original species didn't have to make it onto the Ark either. This is just an example of how many varieties can come from a single point. Unlike breeds of domestic horses, dogs, sheep, and cattle, some of which are thousands of years old, most cat breeds were developed within the past 150 years, mainly in Europe and the United States. Now, in the textbooks, phylogeny of carnivores links cats, skunks, raccoon, bear, and wolves all is having a common ancestor, totally the opposite of creation's predictions. Why do they do this? Why do they assume this in the first place? It is solely because of taxonomy. Anything to them that falls into the carnivore can be linked. Thus, they now have to find other correlations to build their phylogenetic trees. So next, they use homology, which is just ridiculous to me because a raccoon, wolf, and cat well, they have more differences than they do similarities. But like all things, anybody can see what they want if they look hard enough. Lastly, they use genetics, 
But what is a genetic comparison between a cat and a raccoon, or a skunk, or a hyena, or a wolf? Well, that's a good question. Since cats and dogs are supposedly to be genetic cousins of the same tree, they should have a lot of similarities in biology, right? Well, even dogs were closer to humans at 95% than cats were to dogs. Then they found cats were closer to humans. Then dogs were to cats as well. Their common ancestry fell apart with observable, testable genetic data. This just proves how lousy it is to rely on homology or taxonomy to answer any of the tough questions. In conclusion, at least they did say that the cat was very biologically unique. But look, they had to make excuses for finding such genetic discrepancy. Such as, there must have been just too much domestication of the modern day dog's genome and not much of the cats to get this genetic similar match they were looking for. This is their rescuing device for the disaster which showed only a modest comparison between the two species of dog and cat, which were supposed to have more in common than all of the other species which ended up having more, even though those other species, being the cow and human, were well outside of the cat's own taxa clade and species. Can a cat mate with a raccoon since they are supposedly a very close relative to one another? No. Frankly, I have no idea why they try to put these two together, because even taxonomically they are not the same. Cats are pure obligate carnivores, when raccoons are pure omnivores and always have been. It's the same with the skunk. Omnivores, not carnivorans. This also applies to the myocids, who are omnivores as well, which are considered the parent ancestor of all cat lineages. This is not true. Their entire physiology and internal anatomy are entirely different. So obviously, tossing these animals in via taxonomically, saying that they are all pure carnivora, is bias. They smuggle these animal species into carnivora taxa by using wordplay, altering the true meaning of carnivore which should be meat-eating organisms which derive their energy and nutrient requirements from a diet consisting mainly of animal tissue. That's right, taxonomy says carnivory is just incorporating vertebrae flesh into the diet. This way, they can add something into carnivora if they need to without them ever being true carnivores or obligate carnivores. Basically, the only reason all these species made it into the carnivora group is because of their blade-like carnassial teeth match. Which is odd to me, because now we know many bears and dog species today do not eat flesh of any kind. So they assume relation mostly based on homologous teeth structure, even though everything else is vastly different. And in the case like bears, even that doesn't line up. That's right. The true carnassial teeth do not develop in any bear. As far as myocids are concerned, they as well don't have teeth that match up. They actually have molars, and not incisors or carnassial for teeth like all cats have. So they're outside the cat family, and this is obvious based on their structure. Myocids have almost nothing in common with cats' external physiology either. Myocids have long, thin faces as where cats have short, wide ones. Their bodies are long and skinny like a mongoose, which they have also smuggled into the Filiforma family to make common ancestry seem more true. Myocids have no retractable claws as where all cats do. Myocids use smell as where cats use vision. This is what the experts had to say on the subject. On one hand, myocids used to live in packs. Other research has shown that they formed sex-specific groups like meerkats. Therefore, they're outside the cat family tree, based on characteristics as well. That's right, myocids were also omnivores, as where cats, on the other hand, are pesky eaters and only carnivores. This is just another way that we can tell that myocids are not related to cats at all. Myocids have nothing in common with cats' internal physiology as well, from intestinal length, salivatory pH, colon, body shape, etc., very little match down the line with any of these animals. No one would observationally look at a dog, cat, bear, or skunk and presume that they were related at all. Also consider, cats are observational and myocids were olfactory based, so they don't even match in that area. 
So why believe that myocids evolved into all these other species? Assumption and hypothesis is all they really have to link common ancestry together. The matter of fact, since they also claim bears are in the same family, remember? Well, the multiple bears now that has pulled the rug right out from under them as they have all found to be fully fledged plant-eating vegetarians. As you can see, them trying to build their phylogenetic tree connecting all these animals together is totally worthless. Stick to genetics and follow it back. Stop assuming relation based primarily on homology. All they're doing is just digging themselves a bigger hole to get it out of with all their bias assumptions that they need to be true. Cats are genetically breaking down as well, like all things. That's right, mutations abound in the cat kind as well, with over 250 deleterious mutations that have been documented in domestic cats, including taillessness in Mannix cats, congenital defects of white cats, twisted tail syndrome in the American ringtail cats, split foot syndrome in Japanese bobtail, the white tiger lack the capacity to produce red and yellow pigments. This is all caused by a single point mutation in their gene. This is all just more evidence and proof of genomic decay, which is our model of creation, and not evolution and adaptation, like evolutionists want to tell us. Things are not getting stronger, better, and more resistant. They are degrading and getting worse, and all of the evidence proves it. No storytelling required. We creationists also have allele evidence as well to help us determine a created kind. We say the more rare the allele the is, the more mutated. The more common the allele, the more likely it was a created kind. All evidence from existing cat hybrids and lineages, the fossil record evidence and various other features including molecular sequencing data, genetics, pelage, patterns, and unique virus sensitivities, all point to the feline cat family representing a single, clearly delineated basic type. It is reasonable then, with all the evidence available, to say that all these felines arose from a single basal founded cat, and since then, they have passed through one or more adaptive radiations and speciations, exploiting their inherent morphogenetic potential to produce all the known existing and extinct species of cat. Thus, it is reasonable and logical for us as creationists to assume that there was a single cat that was created kind, because all of the evidence clearly shows this to be true. Now, could something prior to the pro Proalirus given rise to it? Sure, why not? But the fact remains, no genetic data, or any data for that matter, solidifies that opinion. The pro Proalirus is the first cat, the first of its created kind, and it populated the entire world we see today. That is what the evidence shows, and that is what we say. The phylogeny challenge has been answered. But what about nymphorids, which are a genius of extinct scimitar or saber-toothed cats only found in North America, are considered not part of the cat order? Well, I am confident that they are wrong on this assumption that nymphorids do not belong to the cat order. The difference between nivirids and the feline order display only minute skeletal differences, indistinguishable in almost every area. This is why there was such a dispute. But calling an extinct cat a non-cat that is otherwise clearly a cat, simply for classification purposes and based solely on ossification bones in their ear, seems excessive and outright dishonest. Why do they do this? Well, because it doesn't match up with their phylogenetic tree that they made. So see how biased they are? If they need something to work, they will just make it up and place it where they want regardless. Yet when it doesn't match up, they ignore it entirely. Nymphorids were like lions and tigers today. DNA has proven that yes, they were cats. What happened is that they speciated from the basal ancestor branch and died off because of extinction. Most people do not realize how easy it is for carnivores to die off. And since we're dealing with the cat species that transition to pure obligate carnivores, and carnivores are very susceptible to extinction, then we can see why there are so many extinct cats back in the fossil record. And we do see this even in many cat species alive today, which have died out via extinction because they are carnivorous and ran out of food sources and pervasive selection from hyperdietary specialization. It is proven that hypercarnivory leads to increased vulnerability and extinction, even wear and cracking on their carnassial teeth may result in the death of the individual due to starvation. Carnassial teeth infection are common in domestic dogs and present as abscesses. 
As for the ecological niche of large carnivores, these animals typically make up only a small part of the ecological diversity of any given area. This fact directly relating to 1. the availability of food and success rate involved in catching something, and 2. territorially. If predators equaled or outnumbered their prey, while also having to contend with disease, injury, and other factors of mortality, the ecosystem would not be sustainable. Carnivores would eat themselves out of house and home, literally. Likewise, given the fact that carnivores do not migrate with herds, rather hold down territories, there is only so much room in a given area for carnivores of a particular species to exist. Given this observation, it is often strange when we come across mass assemblages of carnivores in the fossil record. To me, this is more proof that Noah's flood helped these things form, such as massive dinosaur graveyards. Besides, observation and logic tells us that this is not how animals behave in the world we see today. So why assume that such a large number of predators congregated back then? Think about it. If the group doesn't seem to be a family or a social group, why were they together? The Bible has no documentation on what any of the created kinds were. So we have to infer, using as much genetics as possible, and even the fossil record, unfortunately. And this is really tough because almost all life was wiped out because of Noah's Flood. The Bible is vague on the topic of created kinds because it is not a salvational topic, nor one that needed much attention. The word kind is actually used to describe many different things. Kind, a large group, are called animal kind. Then it is used again with bird kind. Then it becomes more specific with the hawk kind. So it's far too vague to give a specific definition. People should understand that it is an umbrella term, like mankind. Would you not classify a midget, or an albino, or a mongoloid part of mankind? Of course you would. The Hebrew word is where the attention should be, not the English word kind. Original word, in the Strong's Concordance, is that of min, like in minute. It is from an unused root word to portion out, or to sort kind species, a part of a whole, an amount, a section, or a piece of something. So this would mean that kind is a mixture between subspecies and order, and more specifically, near the family. I think the tree of life is an artifact of uh, some early scientific studies that aren't really holding up. So the, the tree, uh, you know, there, there may be a bush of life. Uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, uh, bush, a tree. I don't like that word. <laughs> Rich, Richard, oh, but that's only in oh, I can see uh, that one. Yeah. 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 Uh, so there is not a tree of life. And right. in fact, from our deep sequencing of organisms in the ocean, out of now we have about 60 million uh, different uh, uh, unique gene sets, uh, we found 12 that look like a very, very deep branching, perhaps fourth domain of life.